example is that we have a, a large matrix of data that's sitting in system memory. So everybody understands the basic structure. I don't know if you if you understand the have you seen the basic structure of the cell processor? No, not really. Okay, so what what it has is it has a, a large system memory, and then it has data in local store. And with normal uh, normal issues, with like an x86, if you want to get data out of system memory, it goes into cache, which is effectively fast local memory. Here you've got fast local memory, but the hardware doesn't do anything to get the data from the system memory into the local store. The software that's written is responsible for moving the data back and forth. And so in this situation, we've got this large uh, matrix of data that's sitting in, in the system memory, and it's too big to fit it into the local store memory. This is only 256K bytes, <coughs> excuse me, 256K bytes of memory in local store, and not sufficiently big to fit all the data. So the way that um, the way that the application uh, works is that we're going to break up the data into multiple partitions, and each SPE is going to be responsible for one partition. In our case, we're going to have four. This this only illustrates two. And then what we're go we'll do is we'll do what's called strip mining, which means that we're going to move data into memory, and then we're going to process it, and then we're going to send it back out. So actually we're moving it into memory, we're processing it, we're sending the results back. And this is what is called triple buffering. Um, and so um, what we're going to do is implement that. So we're going to, when we build the application, we're going to put into it one box which is going to form these partitions. We're going to put in another box which is going to do this strip mining, and you'll see that we call it subscheduling. And then we're going to put in two boxes to do the actual processing that's required for um, the uh, pulse compression. This is a pulse compression for SAR. And then we're going to put in another one, a box that will take the data and put it back out to system memory, and then another box that reassembles the data into a large data set where all the partitions are assembled. So that's what we're going to do in this demonstration. And now let me go back to the uh, presentation. So here I have the uh, source box and I've conveniently put this here so that I don't have to spend time uh, putting together this uh, structure. And I'll just put all the boxes in between that I need. And I have some constants down here. These are parameters on our graph and so this is what GDA looks like, and I can uh, create these local parameters that I can use uh, for my processing. Now I'm going to start adding boxes to this, and I will go to the edit menu and add box, and in the add box, um, we've created some uh, uh, some boxes for use here, and um, I'm going to the directory where those boxes are located, and the first uh, box that I'm going to add to the graph is an MZT can, 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 yeah, concat, and um, I'm sorry, an MZT R part. I'll add that one first, and then I'm going to add an MZT concat, and that's a uh, uh, the two boxes, and this one is actually taking and doing the partitioning of the matrix into uh, row partitions, and so I'm going to use that on the front end. And I've already put the one on the back end here, and this GDA put that connection in for me even though I didn't want it, so I'll take that out. And now what I'm going to do is just connect these two boxes into my graph. And now I'll go back to the add box, and now that I've bro broken the matrix into uh, row partitions and I've reconstructed them uh, by concatenating the data, I'm now going to take the tiles, which are sub-matrices, and I'm uh, going to convert those into vectors. And so this is the strip mining part. So I'll add that to the graph, and then I'm going to add the VZMZT, which is going to basically reconstruct the uh, sub-matrices from the vectors, from the rows. 
Uh, so I've got those two on there. Let me move those two over as well into position. And I'll uh, delete this connection again because I'm going to put more boxes in between. So I'll connect those together. Uh, now in between here, I'm going to put my actual processing, whoops, I'm going to put my actual processing of, uh, for the pulse compression, which consists of a vector multiply and uh, followed by an FFT. And so to do that, I'm going to go back to my uh, standard GDATE directory, um, which is what we call the embeddable directory. It has all of our function boxes uh, in it that we provide for stream processing. And um, I'm going to be doing vectors. So um, I will select the vector library. And in split X. Um, and a split X, yes, I need to go into the split X library. That's the type that I, of data that I'm going to process. So the Z on the VZ stands for split X. So I'm going to go in there. And then I'm going to do a multiply. And and the multiply, I am going to multiply by this floating point vector that I put here locally on the canvas. So what I need is a VZ mult V where the V stands for a floating point vector. And so I'll add that to the graph and uh, that's placed in here. And I need one more which is my FFT box and then I have all my functional components that I need for the system. Um, I didn't type FFT right. I have two T's. And so there's my VZ FFT, and I'll add that to the graph. Now, now I've got all my uh, components in the graph. I'm going to uh, connect these. And um, now you notice that there's one problem here, and that's that I've got these red lines with these asterisks. And that's because I haven't defined yet how many um, partitions I'm going to create for, of the matrix. And I want to create P, which is equal to 4. That's cat P. And so we have this range variable, which is an iterator, which is 0 dot dot P minus 1, or 0 to 3. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the family value of those four boxes in the middle to be equal to P, the range variable, so it's a lowercase p. And now I've defined to uh, create a matrix from 4, and to create four submatrices from the matrix. So I've defined those uh, two characteristics. So now, uh, just on, to be on the safe side, I'll save the graph uh, just so I, I have it available to me in case something disastrous should happen, which happens on occasion. So now I'm going to connect. Notice that this is, a, this is an output, it's a tile. And so I'm taking the row tile size and the row size, and I, I've got to put those in here to recreate the matrix so I have the right sizes. And so I'm doing that, and I'll just pretty this up a little bit so we can actually see what the connectivity is. Now I also have to connect this vector, and notice I'm connecting, doing a parameter assignment using uh, this uh, connection. So I've now got all the components of my graph uh, assembled, and I'm going to save this again. And then I'm also going to load uh, parameter settings. And let me just show you first. If I view the, oh, I've already loaded them. I must have loaded them when I started. I forgot I did. But uh, this, this was loaded uh, in the, the default parameter set, and I can see it has been loaded because it does tell me down here in the information window that I've loaded the default parameter. So this is the file of data that I'm going to read. So I'm ready to run this graph and see if it'll work. Now, I'm going to be prototyping the functionality in the development environment. Well, the first thing that happens when I do that is I get this warning from GDA. I mentioned that GDA has over 80 algorithms that analyze the application to determine if it can be implemented. And I need to do something more in order to be able to uh, make it uh, run in a development environment. And it's what we call subsketch.